Another instance, a man, young man comes, he says, Ya Rasulullah, إِذَنْ لِي بِزِنَا Allahu Akbar. He said to Rasulullah, give me permission for zina. He's saying this not to mom and dad. He's saying to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, upon whom the deen has been revealed, upon whom the Quran has been revealed. The, the people heard him and they got so upset and they started reprimanding him. How dare you go say this to the Prophet Alaihi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How did he respond? He said, Mahma those go leave him, leave him. He said something unthinkable. But this it's if someone comes and says to you, Why this about Islam? Why this about the Quran? Why I don't understand this? I don't believe this, or I I have a hard time believing this. He's already what I use the word infected. Now if you go say, I will be there, shame on you, astaghfirullah, you're my son, and you say something like that. It's too late. Now the fact that he Ovid opened up to you, that was great. If you say something like this, we don't even know where his infections are. He's coming to you and telling you he's in pain. Now this is not the time to slap him. This is the time to actually address the issue. If someone comes and says something absolutely unacceptable in deen, how should we handle that? This is not the time to say, A'udhu Billahi Salaam Right? This is just going to cause even bigger problem. Instead, Understand what he or she just told you. Realize your son needs help. If you cannot get help, if you cannot help yourself, call 911. Meaning, you call the masjid, call the ulama, alim, call the shaykh, and say, how am I supposed to deal with this situation? I have a son or daughter right now who just said something which is completely un-Islamic, unacceptable. A child who says, again, I identify X, Y, Z in today. I want to change my gender. I'm attracted to the same. If, what are you going to do with it? You're going to say, I'll be and take a anger and beat him up. You can't do that. Right? That does not, that will not remove the infection. That will not remove the problem. The doubt is seeped in. Now you need to deal with it. And deal with it does not mean you beat him up or you scold them. Deal with it means you perform surgery. Very stealthily, very nicely, you go try to take out that cancer. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa with hikmah, he said, Udnuhu, bring him close to me. He says, I want to do zina. He said, bring him close to me. Bring him close to me. And then, فَدَنَا مِنْهُ قَرِيبًا He came very close to Rasulullah Wasallam. فَجَلَسَ فَجَلَسَ He sat, and this is what's mentioned, right? لَمْ يُخَاطِبُ مِنْ بَعِيدٍ The Prophet Wasallam did not speak to him from a distance. Hey, boy, don't do this. He brought him close. Make him feel special. Make him know that, hey, I'm sharing whatever I'm sharing to you is between you and I. This is between us. Not, no one needs to know about this. You, you get them in your confidence. Make them, give them what we call it, what they call it? Safe space. These people of batil and falsehood, Allah forbid, are providing so-called safe spaces. And our own homes do not provide a safe space for our children. Our masjids are not a safe space for our children at times. Because not having good leadership. People who don't know how to deal with this. You know, if a person walks into the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dressed inappropriately, you have to deal with it the way the Prophet ﷺ dealt with someone urinating in the masjid. It's too late. It's too late. Now, he's already started urinating there. If you stop him, it, it, that it cannot stop, it will actually spread, the urine will spread. It will be painful. It won't stop, it will become a bigger problem. And if you get angry, like anyone would naturally want to, he'll never come back to the masjid, you'll never get a chance to even teach him. So someone comes, male, female, whatever, comes inappropriately dressed to the masjid. This is not the time where we pounce on them. It's in a time where, with muhabba and love, we, someone, not 10 people, not 100 people, one person, ideally the imam for example, Deal with them with wisdom and hikmah. Take them to a private area. Don't scold them in the public. Don't teach them in the public. Take them to the private area. And speak with them with lots of wisdom and hikmah. And teach them this is the etiquette of the house of Allah. Like Rasulullah SAW said, these masajid are meant for the remembrance of Allah. These other things are not, you know, allowed over here. After he finished. After the man finished. So, because of us not having, like you know they say, don't become more Christian than the Pope. Don't become more pious than Rasulullah. Don't think that you have more muhabba and love for the masjid than your Nabi. This is not love for, this is your own personal anger. That's not how it works. 
You, t- you say something harsh to a person and he walks away and leaves the masjid. How are you going to deal with that in the court of Allah Azza wa Jal tomorrow? I sent a servant, poor servant of mine who wanted to change his life. Who do you think you are that you kicked him out of my house? This is, never was your house. I don't care who built it or who does what. This is my house. Always been Allah's house. Who are we to sit there and kick someone out? Out of the, you know, protecting the sanctity of the masjid. Yes, there may be certain instances where a person is uh, majnoon. A person is inflicting harm upon himself or others. Physical harm or other type of harm. A person may need to deal with that with, from a place of love. That you say, no, we're going to take you to get help. Not to say you're, we're going to throw you out on the street. But we're going to try to get you the muhabba and the love, uh, you know, try to get you the help that's there. I know what I'm saying is not easy in all circumstances. I realize that. But I'm just simply trying to say is that we try our best not to shut the doors of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon a sincere but misguided individual. A sincere but, uh, you know, ignorant individual of the deen. The job for ignorance is that we teach them. You know that, that and I'm sorry. The job of our, our, all of us is to teach people who do not have the knowledge. So Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam then spoke to him with a soft tone, and he said, "Atuhibhu li ummika." Would you like this for your mother that someone does this? He says, "La, la, Allah, jalani Allah fi daak." He changed his tone. May Allah subhanahu wa taala make me your ransom. May Allah make me a ram. May Allah make me a shield to protect you from any harm. Never. I would never like this for my mother. Okay. Qala wala nasu yuhabbunahu li ummahatihim. People do not like this for their mothers either. You're not alone. You're on the right track. You're exactly making sense. You say what everyone says. Yeah. You know, you're on the same page. Okay. Then he says, Afa tuhibbuhu li ibnatik? Afa tuhibbuhu li ukhtik? Right? Would you like this for your daughter? Would you like this for your sister, your, your aunt, etc.? فَوَضَعًا He said, no, no. فَوَضَعًا النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِيَدَهُ عَلَيْهِ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم put his hand on him. Now imagine a great person like the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Of course, he got the barakah of the blessed hands of Rasulullah. But imagine how this man felt. That this is the love I am receiving. I'm misguided. Everyone's jumping on me. But look at this Nabi, how he puts his hand on the Prophet, on this man, and this young person. And he says, Allahumma ghfir dhambahu. Oh Allah, forgive his sins. Wa tahir qalbahu. And oh Allah, purify his heart. Wa hassin farjahu. And oh Allah, grant him chastity. Make him chaste. Make him chaste. Alright? So now, what we learn from here is that even if someone comes to us with an outlandish situation, your own son and daughter say something outlandish against the deen, beloved brothers and sisters, this is the time to show them love. This is the time to show them care. We're not saying what you said is right. No, you're going to say, but he, he, he said something against... He said, you know, this example is like your child, Allah forbid, or not, I hope never happens to your child or my child. But they're already at the roof of the house with a knife in their hand and they're gonna say I wanna kill myself or I wanna jump how would you deal with this situation? you cannot get angry you have to talk them out of it in a very nice soft loving tone the way they speak to a hostage taker no one screams at a hostage taker usually they're mentally distraught psychologically distraught individuals it's a tense situation. You have to de-escalate it. So when a son or a daughter becomes rebellious against Allah and His Rasul and against your parents, this is the time to now de-escalate the situation in a very calm manner. Your calmness and softness does not mean you approve of what they are saying against Allah and His Rasul. But rather you want them to come down from the roof, come down from the lobby and not take their life. And then you can get them the attention they need. Right now you need them to put their arms down and open up to you fully. So that you can hold them, grab them, guide them to a better place than where they are right now. So don't think again, are you telling me someone is speaking ill about Allah and Rasul and I don't get mad? It won't help the situation. Do you not want Allah and Rasul to be respected? 
You know what the ayah you should remember? Do not curse those people. Do not curse the non-Muslims and the mushrikeen. Do not curse those who worship someone besides Allah. Otherwise, they will end up cursing Allah. You have caused people to curse Allah and curse the Prophet by cursing them or their gods first. That's why don't cause a situation for yourself like this. Nabi Alaihissalam said, in one hadith, the gist of which is don't curse your parents. Now, of course, nowadays we're like, okay, yeah, we got that. But that time the Sahaba didn't understand that. What do you mean curse your parents? How could a person ever, ever, ever speak back or curse their parents? Something that was unfathomable. Then he explained. He said, the way that happens is when you curse someone else's parents. Then in retaliation, he says, oh, you said that about my mother? Well, I'm going to say this about your mother. So what happened? You ended up cursing, getting your mother cussed out. You, got, you, you ended up getting your own father yelled at, or screamed at, or cursed at. Because you cursed someone else's parent, and this was retaliation. So Rasulullah basically equated you cursing someone else to cursing your own parents. Because look at the retaliation. You curse Allah, and you curse a, 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 non, a, a disbeliever, or their God, it's equivalent to getting Allah cursed out. A'udhu Billah. So dealing with our child inappropriately, now that he is already fed up with deen, will end up getting Allah Azza wa Jal and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam belied. Why would you like that? I'm giving you a way to understand this situation. Because some of us might say, Brother, I love my deen. I don't care if it's my son. I love my Allah. If, if he says this, that's it. I'm going to go after him. What do you mean go after him? Will you be able to change him? No. He will continue cursing Allah even more. He will continue to curse the deen even more. So this is part of your love for Allah, part of your love for Rasulullah that you de-escalate the situation and not take a st- stubborn, strong stance at that time. You need to, you have to, you, like mistakes have been made before. We are basically suffering from mistakes of the past. What happened, we can go reflect on what happened. Now let's deal with the situation and that is we have to do it in a very soft, kind manner. SubhanAllah, so this will became an, uh, a further introduction to this beautiful hadith. How much ilm there is in the deen is unbelievable. Ajeeb, from one hadith, we didn't go to the second and third piece of advice, which we will, inshallah, in the future, if Allah Azza wa Jalla grants us all life, inshallah. But uh, you, you, how do we feel now after listening? Do we not genuinely feel that the only place to find solutions to our problems is in deen? There's no problem, no situation that you and I are going through, or anyone else in this ummah is going through, but that Allah and His Rasul have given us the answer. It's all there in hadith. It's all there in the Quran. It's all there in the writings of our ulama. But a person needs to have this trust. If we're looking, uh, you're looking for your keys on the roof, how are you going to find it, bai? How are you going to find it? If we're looking for solutions all over, except for in Islam, we're not going to be able to find it. We're going to be lost. May Allah give us tawfiq to look for the solutions in the deen. Allow us to find those solutions. And allow us to, inshallah, practice on it and share it with others as well. Do any of you here have any relevant uh, questions that you would like to ask um, before we do the dhikr and dua? Anyone here have any relevant questions? Or just yes, brother. Ch- children, youth, ages, what ages? Children of Guinea. Uh, what is the, some advice on on, uh, on 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 towing out a twelve-year-old or a fifteen-year-old? Right. Um, well, besides whatever I, I mentioned already uh, about making sure it's coming from a place of love and muhabba, um, you know, whatever we speak about, it's getting a lot of chance to, you know, you have to understand who you're dealing with, right? What, again, let's look at a hostage crisis. Are they, uh, what do you do? What's the first thing in a hostage crisis? You let the person speak. Correct? If you were screaming, hey, how did you do this, man? This is crazy. That's not going to work. You're going to hear gunshots. Game over. Right? You have to let that person vent. He's going to say, I lost my job. I got a problem with my girlfriend. He didn't go on his old thing. Like, okay. And then you have to show empathy. So we have to let our children, for example, speak. Sometimes it's outlandish. You didn't give me that bike when I was five years old. Like, what are you talking about? I gave you a hundred other things. And you forgot the other bike that, you, that I did get you. Okay, this is not the time to go back and forth. Just let them, you know, vent. 
and talk about all their problems. Because when children become disobedient, or especially start leaving the deen, this is a symptom of some, uh, you know, low-lying issues that you didn't see, or I wasn't aware of, that underlying issues. We have to get to that issue until you don't figure out where the water leak is coming. Don't we, when you have a water leak in the house, uh, for example, or your roof leaks, you're like, oh, I wish this rain, I wish it continues to rain till my roofer comes, yeah? Because you want to figure out what's happening. Because if, you, if, the rain, if it's not raining, there's no way you're going to figure out where the building is leaking from. So, <clears throat> when it's raining, and it's, you, you start, this is like perfect. Let me take a video, let me make notes of where it's leaking. So when, they're t- when they start speaking, you want it for them to come all out. All out. When, where, which incident, which place, how did this all start? What triggered this? Get it? Because it's usually trauma. It is trauma many times. And when did this trauma happen? How did it happen? And what is causing this child to become so angry? I mean, this is real things I'm telling you. That it's trauma. This anger is based on some bad experience that they had. Was at the madrasa, at the masjid, at the Islamic school, at it with a relative, with an uncle, maybe with the way we said. I remember Nadir Ali Khan, alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah, one of the elders of Tabligh and a professor of, of Aligarh University. An amazing individual. Allah Akbar. I remember I heard one time in his bayan, he was talking about his own grandchild, I think so. And he said, you know, uh, he said there was guests there and he was, the four-year-old was acting up. So the mom or dad scolded him, the child. He says, after the guests left, the child, you know, bursted out crying. And he was angry and he was hurt. Four-year-old, five-year-old. And he was saying, you know, right? Why did you scold me in front of the guest? Why did you get mad at me? And he was so angry and he was so upset and hurt that why did you scold me in front of the guest? He said, a four-year-old has emotions. A four-year-old has emotions. You cannot just get up and just scold him anytime you want. Because he's, got, he's broken, he's heartbroken. What he did was wrong. But you have no right to break the heart of a four-year-old. So if a four-year-old has emotions, you think a 14-year-old doesn't have one? That's the problem. I think we just become so emotionless ourselves. We don't understand that people, you know, they have to be dealt in a kind manner. Yeah, we have to correct them. But how do we correct them? So that's a trauma. If a person was scolded, say, in front of her, if his cousins or his relatives or so forth, uh, many, this is the old Desi habit. Always scold the kids in front of other people. How many times I've seen it myself? Almost yeah, in front of the public. Yeah, this kid is a useless one. Make dua for him. He's a he's a he's a loser. This kid, he's he's a plus student. He's doing great. His brother, oh man, barely can get seats. Why do we need to know about all these things? You need in confidence. You come and share. Can you give me some advice? But in front of the child, you are comparing him to his sibling, her sibling, and you are denouncing them in front of a, even one or two or three relatives or friends absolutely not allowed but we don't think doesn't this happen? this is the norm this is the norm and we, what, this, what kind of culture is this? this is no deen this is jahalat this is ignorance absolutely not deen so we need to let these children speak is what I'm saying you, you just make mental notes of what's going on maybe even Record it and take no, literally write notes because right at that time you're so emotional as a dad or a mom or a sibling or a brother or whatever it is that you might not be able to remember all of that. So if there's a possible, you just record that conversation with the sake of literally re-listening to it and taking notes to figure out exactly what it is. Because when a person sometimes loses their temper, they, they let it all out. You need that. You need that venting session. Got that? That's the very first thing. Once you figure out when and where and how this trauma happened, then you try to start addressing it. And people who were victims, like anyone therapist will tell you, the last thing they want you to know, hear, and which is incorrect, is to tell them that it was their fault. It doesn't work like that. At, you have to shift the blame from that person. Because he will never be able to heal if you keep on making him feel incorrectly that it's them to the blame. Oh, why didn't you tell me at that time? Okay, it's over. Why, you know, it's, it's, you just say, okay, at that time, you know what? I didn't know. I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Not to say, why didn't you tell me? Because that's just going to make him even more angry. 
So you say, I wish I knew this happened. I wish I was aware. May Allah forgive me for not doing more than whatever I have done and I did to find out this situation. So what I'm saying is you need to basically give them an, a reason or an excuse for their behavior. You have to make them understand. Not to say that what they're doing is right. But rather, give them a logical explanation so that they feel not violated. They feel that you are understanding where they come from. Not to say what you just did is right. I understand your frustration. I may have done the same thing. I may have broken this vase out of anger. I understand where you're coming from. Is it right that you broke a vase? No, it's not. We don't need to talk about that right now. We're simply letting them know we understand the underlying issues that cause them to, to uh, you know, lash out, for example. So that, that goes a long way. Because then they say, oh, subhanAllah, I'm being validated. Not to say what I did is wrong, right, but at least they, my, this person understands my frustrations. That's such an important part. And then the third thing is, uh, you start paving a way out for them. To say, whatever happened has happened. Now we're going to go towards healing. If you're frustrated about your experience, no problem. We're going to make it better. I had a horrible experience, XYZ place in the masjid. That's why I'm here. We're going to make sure that not only that does not happen, but that the rest of your experiences are even much better. And how? You choose. Let's talk about it. How can we have a better experience? Can we go to a different place? Can we, go, can we travel? Can we go for a short vacation? Can we do this? Can we do that? What, what, will, be, what will help you, uh, you know, you decide? What do you want? Let me hear from you. If you simply says, no, I don't want help. No, that's not that. I'm here to help. I have to. I'm your mom and dad. I'm your older sibling, etc. I'm here to help. I'm your uncle. I'm here to help. So we cannot just say no. All of this may not happen within the first experience. It may take a few tries. But eventually, inshallah, we'll be successful. Um, another thing is that the, the, the explanation of deen that we give to our kids, it needs to be very subtle. Should not be direct. You have to do it in a subtle manner. You're, you're going to, a, you're going to a, you find out there's a good deeny program happening in another part of the country. For example, and so you, let's, let's plan out a weekend vacation. You plan it out. Be smart. Come on. We're all, mashallah, intelligent professionals. You go to eat out here. You got to go to rides over there. And just happen to pray Lohar, which you already know which masjid you're going for Lohar that has a program with a scholar. And you say, oh, mashallah. This is like, you know what? Mashallah, we've had such a great weekend. We're going to go out again to ice cream. How about we sit for half an hour? Right? And then we leave. But it's got to be done very nonchalantly. It seemed as though it was kind of haphazard and just happened out of nowhere. Use hikmah and wisdom and how you play that. Third thing is use ruqya as well. Right? Ruqya, either ruqya where you can get a son or daughter or young man or woman, if they are willing to read or listen to ruqya, mashallah. But if they're not willing to read or listen to ruqya, then there are certain ruqya that a father or mother or concerned parent can do for their own loved one. And I'll share one with you right now. This is something that was shared with me by my ustad in this past summer. Is that a person uh, uh, recites, for example, the, it's, it's called Ayatul Qutub. It is, ثُمَّ أَنزَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ الْغَمْ Ayah from Surah Al-Imran, uh, Al Ayah um, number 154. Ayah 154 of Al-Imran, which is the third surah of the Quran. Okay? ثم أنزل عليكم من بعد الغم أمنة النعاس يخشى طائفة منكم إلى آخره. Till the end of the ayah, this is the uh, ayah that was revealed in the Battle of Uhud. You can read the translation of it. <clears throat> but this ayah, ayah 154, and ayah 200, which is the last ayah of Surah An-Nisa as well. Um, Al Imran. I'm sorry, last ayah of Al Imran, right before Surah An-Nisa starts. So ayah 154 and ayah 200. Ayah 154 and ayah 200 of which surah? Al Imran. Ya alladhina musbiru wa sabiru wa rabitu wa taqullaha la'allakum tuflihun. Very effective of removing that shaitan that sometimes overtakes anyone, including our kids. And a person, the method of reciting that, he explained to me, was that a person should, uh, you know, this is what we call tajarib of the ulama. This is from the experiences of our scholars. Not to say that there is a hadith specifically about what I'm sharing. But the fact that the Quran is shifa. Quran is the best cure. So ulama have found this, this specific verse to be beneficial for the situation that we're dealing with. That a person recites um, uh, Hisar, Ayatul Kursi, three times, five times, seven times, odd number of times, Ayatul Kursi. Uh, the last page of Surah Al-Baqarah. 
Amin al-Rasul, the last three verses. Okay? And then, Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghith. Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghith. The two great names of Allah, begging Him, begging him for assistance. That seven times. Ayatul Kursi, odd number of times. Once the last three ayats of Surah Al-Baqarah. And then, Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghith, seven times. And then a person makes niyyah, intention. That through the barakah of these recitals, Allah is protecting me. Like an aura of protection around me, and an aura of protection around the brother or sister, son or daughter, nephew or niece, uncle or aunt, mom or dad, that I'm making dua for. Once that's done, then we begin to recite this ayah. ثُمَّ أَنزَلْ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ الْغَمْ Read this odd number of times. However much Allah gives you tawfiq. 11 times, 21 times, 41 times with focus that through the barakah of this Ya Allah whatever is sitting on their mind be, may be removed whatever is sitting on their heart that is dis- taking them away from the deen may be removed and the next one is Ya Ayyuladina Amunus Biru Wa Sabiru Wa the ayah I shared with you read that as well and just to tell you an example he said one of his students came to him he said my brother has been locked up depressed in his room for I don't know how many days as, unfortunately this is happening in too many of our homes right now People who are depressed and sitting on their video games locked up. So he said, he, I gave him this ayah. He sat, he, the brother sat down to read. We literally within minutes, he opened the door and came out. All right? And it was just like something just got removed from him. You have a child that all of a sudden went to a party and now all of a sudden starts screaming and crying. It happens. You, your kids are dressed up nicely. Kids get ayin and nadar very quickly. All, right? they, all of a sudden tri- start tripping and falling. Like, what's going on? Everything is fine. Now, non stop. So, recite this. You'll see, inshallah, it's about better. And Ya'il ibn Amun Sbiru wa Sabiru, this is for istiqam and jadeen. Istiqam and jadeen. Along with the method I shared with you, he advised that Ya'il ibn Amun Sbiru wa Sabiru Rabitu, this last ayah, ayah 200, should be recited on a, a food item that we eat regularly at home, the children, or whoever you're making dua for. Say something every single day, you're going to put sugar in their tea or coffee or whatever else or anything else you're putting on salt something that's going to be used on home regularly recite this verse odd number of times 21 times more or less and blow it on that food item so that it's being ingested every single day so uh, t- to uh, uh, wrap that up is that ruqya is very important in this day and age in dealing with all of these situations because beyond all the external ways that we use to treat our um, you know, sick individuals, spiritually sick individuals, we have to use uh, Quran as well. Because there's no doubt that this is a massive attack of shaitan on our children and our community that we are seeing the suffering of. Does that answer your question? Good. So thank you for asking that. I think others also benefited from that. G. When you're dealing with haram, your loved one is drinking, your loved one is in, uh, using uh, intoxicants, drugs, etc. This is haram, what am I supposed to do? Well, now we have to realize that y- your goal would be that I want to, in my heart, I, it's like, you know, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if you have the ability, stop it with your tongue. If you have the ability, stop it with your hand. If you have the ability, if you can't do that, all that, then at least feel bad about it in your heart. The situation right now is you're dealing with an, with an adult who, ha- who will just easily walk out and even go into a bigger problem. So, you are now, it's not like under, oh, it's not under my roof. Well, at least you want someone to remain a Muslim under your roof. If right now, if we, if we, if we make it uh, difficult, and we say, no, this is not permissible, more than likely they will leave the house, and then unfortunately leave Islam as well. So we, again, we are not okay with them indulging in haram, but we're looking at the big picture, that if we now, it's like what this hadith says, if you cannot, if you cannot, then at least feel guilty in your heart. And so yeah, you cannot, right now you cannot grab their beer bottles and throw it away, because depending on who the person is, but you know, they may end up just you know, becoming violent and physical with you, or just leaving the house, and it's not like good riddance, I wouldn't say that, because there are chances of people actually coming back to the deen over time. Especially, I want all of you to understand the importance of of ruqya, even for addictions. It requires a lot of ruqya as well, on top of all these other things that you might be, uh, you know, uh, beneficial. 
So it takes time. Ruqya doesn't happen. How many people are actually practicing on Ruqya? How many people are sitting there reading Adhkar? How many people are reading Tahajjud? How many people are doing various things? Unfortunately, not too many. People just come, you know, I try to talk my son out of it, but he doesn't listen. Well, talking is not going to work always. Sometimes you have to talk to Allah. Right? Just sit there and speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and use all the means available, spiritual means available, to combat this issue. Yes. When a person reads the ayah of Ruqyad, is it important to pay attention to the meaning? You should have conviction that through the barakah of, of the recital of the word of Allah, Allah will assist. Surah Fatiha, if a person recites it with a knee of shifa from hadith, Allah will give shifa. Even if you don't know the meaning, you read Qul A'udhu Falaq, Qul A'udhu Nas, for the knee of, of protection, Allah will protect you from the evil. Yes, it's to help you focus. By all means, you can go ahead and read the translation and the tafsir of it. That's, that's fine, but it's not necessary. The key thing is yaqeen, conviction from the heart. Anything else? Well, I didn't expect it to go this long, but you, you, all of you, subhanAllah, Allah reward you for being patient. And now you're going to say, hey, we need lunch. Brunch, huh? Yeah, so, yeah. Inshallah, Allah, Allah accept and, and make it easy for all. Guide my children, your children, our parents, our siblings, and keep us guided. And, and, and wherever we are making mistakes, and we are going towards misguidance in our own lives, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to understand where we are faltering and failing and allow us to rectify ourselves. <clears throat> we will inshallah uh, do some dhikr for a few minutes. Um, you can join uh, uh, by doing dhikr out loud or just in an audible tone or do dhikr in your heart. Just do dhikr in your heart, you know, uh, as you wish inshallah, whatever you're comfortable with. Bismillah.